Are you feeling resentful, burned out, and underpaid at work? We have created a masterclass for you. It's called Beat Burnout and Build Wealth. Three simple steps to scale your income without changing jobs or specialties. If you want to join us, here's how it works. Tap the link in the show notes or go to tracybingaman.com slash masterclass. Choose a time that works for you and then bring your A game to the masterclass and be ready to take notes and then take action. Doing nothing and not attending this masterclass results in nothing. And unless you take action, you'll keep earning that same below market value income, feeling resentful and burned out. Change requires action and signing up for the Beat Burnout and Build Wealth Masterclass is the first best step to take. Head to the show notes or tracybingaman.com slash masterclass to be the first to have access to your preferred dates and times and to find one that works for you. We'll see you there. Welcome to the PA is in the show created by PAs for PAs where codependency with your supervising physician is a thing of the past. Optimal team practice is the future and physician associate has taken the place of physician assistant as the professional title of choice. I'm Tracy Bingaman and I'm obsessed with redefining what success as a PA looks like and what it feels like. Here you'll find the mindset shifts, systems, and processes I use to escape healthcare burnout and integrate my work into my life. Work-life balance is a myth and an integrated life where you thrive professionally, not a balancing act, is the goal here. My mission is to help you to grow into a unicorn PA who loves their job, has abundant energy, time to spare, and work optional financial freedom. The PA is in. Do you ever feel like student loans are just this super heavy burden? Like we worked so hard to get into school and then we worked so hard in school and then we got out and now we're working so hard to pay off the loans that paid for that school that was so stressful and so hard to get through in the first place. I'd like to introduce you to one of our first returning ever guests, Kristen Burton. Kristen was a guest previously. We talked about um, finance, personal finance, and growing wealth. But today we're going to focus specifically on the thorn in the side of almost every healthcare provider, student loans. Kristen is an expert on this topic and helps lots of providers to get out from under six-figure student loan debt. She's going to dive into the SAVE program, talk about the current status of interest rates on federal student loans, and help you to have some really practical, tangible tips on how to create a strategy and work that strategy for getting out of your student loan debt. Without further ado, here she is, Kristen Burton. Kristen, I think this is the first time I'm able to say this on the show. Welcome back. Yay. Thank you so much for having me back. I would love it if you would take a minute to introduce yourself to our listeners, tell them who you are and what you do. Yes. So I'm Kristen Burton. I am a practicing critical care PA and the founder of Strive Coaching. So um, essentially, I started my journey as a PA like most folks with a lot of debt. I paid off my $161,000 in student loan debt in 16 months and then went on to become a millionaire at 31 through investing in the stock market and real estate um, both. And so kind of as a result of my own struggle, my own journey, I ended up founding Strive to help educate other medical professionals on all things personal finance. And that's why I'm here talking to you today. Awesome. So I want to talk a lot about student loans. We have had a conversation about all things personal finance and budgeting and financial independence. I will link that in the show notes if you guys want to head on back and see our first conversation with Kristen. But today we're going to really focus on student loans and what a burden that is for providers and for people who have sacrificed so many years in training and invested in themselves and their education. So before we dive in, what is the current status of federal student loans? So I feel like this has changed a lot in the last couple of years, mid-pandemic, post-pandemic. Where have things settled and where are things right now? Yeah, I think the biggest change that we've seen is the introduction of the SAVE plan. That's the thing that's been most applicable across the board for medical professionals. And it has actually been the cause of a lot of big student loan mistakes um, from folks not really having a long-term 
financial picture for what their loans are going to be like and sort of picking a payment plan based on, you know, what's going to be the lowest payment, which makes the budget look better, um, or, you know, what their colleague or coworker is doing. And for that reason, I think the biggest change that's come about, you know, post-COVID has actually created some pandemonium for those of us with you know, six figures of student loan debt, which is most medical professionals. So could you tell us how the program works and then zoom out and say, this is kind of how it works. And this is how you can not make that faux pas and not kind of say, I don't want to pay more than I have to. I'm going to pay the lowest amount, which means your student loans are going to outlive you. <laughs> yeah. So basically, in short order, the save plan for most will have the lowest or one of the lowest monthly payments um, of any of the payment plans. The way that it's uh, made up, it is actually a percentage of the federal poverty limit based on your family size is how they determine your discretionary income. And then that translates into what your monthly payment will be. SAVE actually uses 225% of the federal poverty level, where some of the other income-driven repayment plans will use 100 or 150%. And so when you combine that with the fact that SAVE also uses a 5% metric of discretionary income for undergrad loans and 10% for graduate loans, it can actually be a really low payment, especially for people with a lot of undergraduate component to their student loan debt. Now, probably the biggest perk of SAVE is the interest subsidy. So what happens is if your payment is actually less than the interest that would have accrued, the remaining interest is waived. And that little fact has been kind of plugged out all over social media and gets people excited like, wow, you know, some interest is potentially being waived that I would have had to pay otherwise, like, where do I sign up? <laughs> and so for that reason, a lot of people have hopped on board. But I think you have to zoom way out and recognize when you're paying off your student loans in general, you are essentially choosing one of three broad strategies. You're either choosing a traditional payoff, which may be over 10 years, maybe you're doing it faster than that. So maybe we'll say four strategies, traditional payoff, accelerated payoff, public service loan forgiveness, or taxable loan forgiveness. Now, I will say public service loan forgiveness. There are other forgiveness programs too, but that's the one that by and large applies to most of us in medicine. So we'll kind of lean into that. What, what happens with those latter two plans, public service loan forgiveness and the taxable loan forgiveness plan, would be you would choose an income-based repayment plan for a lot of folks that you know, maybe save. And then you're going to pay a much smaller amount per month than you ordinarily would if you were doing a 10-year track or especially if you were being aggressive and paying it off quickly. So by paying less amount per month, you are increasing the duration of time that you would pay on the loans. Now, if you're doing public service loan forgiveness, this beautiful thing happens when you hit the 10-year mark the remaining balance is forgiven on a tax-free basis, which is really, really cool. If you're doing taxable loan forgiveness, what will happen is any remaining balance at 20 to 25 years is going to be forgiven as well. You don't have to have a qualifying employer. You don't have to meet any specific criteria. It'll be forgiven, but it will be taxed when it is forgiven. And so when you hear people talk about planning for the tax bomb, that's what they mean is a taxable loan forgiveness at the end of that very prolonged period of paying on your loans, multiple decades, right? Any remaining balance is forgiven. So if you choose, let's say you choose save, and let's say that your debt to income ratio is low, we'll call it less than one, meaning the total amount you owe is less than your annual income. So let's say you owe 50,000 and you earn 100,000. If you go on the income-based repayment plan save, you're probably not gonna have a remaining balance at the 20 to 25 year mark. There'll be nothing to be forgiven. It'll take you a good long time to clear that debt paying that very small payment. And you'll increase the amount you pay back in total as a result, but you probably won't ever have the tax bomb. In contrast, if you have a really high debt to income ratio, maybe it's three to one or four to one, meaning 
you owe $300,000 in student loans and you earn 100K. Well, now you probably will have a balance remaining at the end of that 20 to 25 years. And you can anticipate when that money is forgiven, you'll have a very big tax bill associated and um, you should be planning accordingly. The higher your debt to income ratio, the more likely it is that when you go to have that amount forgiven at the end, you know, it might be hundreds of thousands of dollars forgiven. And so your taxes can be large, tens of thousands, and in some cases, even six figures. So it is something where when you're making these selections, you have to understand the long implications. And if you are pursuing something like that, the kind of taxable loan forgiveness route, you should know already on the front end, well, this is going to be my balance at 20 to 25 years. And as a result, I can anticipate a tax bill of X and start saving for that. So that you don't wind up, you know, at the, at the age of 52 or whatever it is with a $100,000 tax bill that you didn't anticipate. So it's not that there's really a right or a wrong. It's simply understanding how it works overall and having the 30,000 foot view when you make these kind of selections. Thinking of a career shift in 2024, Advanced Scope is one of the only PA consulting firms optimizing your job hunt without taking away from your earning potential. They don't dip into your paycheck and your job search remains 100% confidential at no cost to you. Through partnering with practices nationwide, they know about opportunities before LinkedIn or Indeed even posts them. Connect with their CEO, Madison, today by going to advancedscopetalent.com and booking an exploratory call. Your future career and paycheck will thank you. This is one of my kids just discovered Google Maps. So he is like super, he found it at school. And so he's always like, can I go on the computer and look at Google Maps? And I feel like making the decision to just, you know, whole hog, get the smallest payment plan is like looking at a house super zoomed in. And then you're like, oh no, we have to actually zoom out and look at the neighborhood and how far it is from work and how far it is from school, you know, to figure out if that's a good house for us. And this is not just how the monthly payment affects your budget and your lifestyle, but rather also, you know, what does that look like five, 10, 15 years down the road? What, you know, what are the long-term things, which I think trips us up financially a lot because we want immediate gratification. We want as much money, you know, that we can spend on things now as we can, but really thinking what are the long-term implications of making this choice? And this is for many people, a huge amount of money. And I think that that number, even when you're saying four to one debt to income ratio, that feels heavy to me when you're saying, oh my gosh, we owe four times as much as we're going to bring home this year or earn this year. That's a lot. Can you talk to the people who are just thinking, I am just so buried under these student loans. They're never going to go away. What encouragement do you have for the person who is looking at that number on their balance sheet saying, whew, I don't know. That's a huge, huge mountain to climb. Yeah. The first thing I'll say is that it, even though that feels like it's your biggest money problem, the insurmountable student loan debt, it's probably not. And you can actually be tremendously successful financially and have a large student loan burden. So don't let that be the thing that creates a weird limiting belief in your mind of like, I'm bad at money because I'm drowning in student loan debt. Um, that's definitely not the case. How you decide to clear that is very important. And I think actually that phase, that first piece of deciding how to clear it is one of the most important steps to getting out of the overwhelm. Um, this actually has been studied in the world of social sciences, which, you know, in our world of evidence-based medicine studies are a little different, but in the social science realm, they did take a look at this and they actually found that it wasn't always the numer numerical amount of debt that correlated to stress and actually depression. It was the feeling of being able to manage it. And so maybe you do owe $500,000 in student loan debt. But if you have really dug in, you know what you're doing, maybe you've said, okay, I'm going to find a qualifying employer. I'm going to do PSLF. I'm going to max out my 401k and my 457 or my 403b and my 457. I'm going to have tons of investments along the way, really minimize that student loan payment. I'm going to have a ton forgiven tax-free. 
your balance sheet might not look that good because up until that amount's forgiven, your net worth statement's probably gonna be pretty negative and you're gonna see that big, you know, red, huge number on there. But you actually will relieve yourself of some of the overwhelm just by knowing, hey, look, I have a plan and I, I feel as though I can now manage this, so to speak. I think a lot of the overwhelm comes from sitting there and not having any clue what you're going to do about it and just feeling the weight. And that was my own personal experience. I mean, I remember feeling physically ill over my student loan debt. But once I had a plan, a lot of that went by the wayside and it felt like, okay, I, I have a plan. I'm going to work the plan. And so I channeled the energy into something positive rather than sitting there and going, oh my gosh, you know, I'll never get out of this. So I would love if we could dive a little bit more into, you know, we've talked about these four options of, you know, traditional or accelerated payoff, doing the save and, you know, having some forgiveness coming down the line with PSLF. What about the people who either are like, I don't want to work for a qualifying employer. I like my job. We, we don't live in an area where that's possible or, you know, the way that I want to practice medicine that either is some, not something that I can do or not something that I want to do. So the person who is like, I'm kind of going it alone, right? I'm going to pay these off myself. What are some tips that you have for that person who is like, what is the best approach? Is it the snowball? Is it the avalanche? How, what, what do we do in order to feel like we're making some traction as we're paying those down? Tracy here. I just wanted to pop in and tell you a little bit about the difference between the debt snowball and the debt avalanche. I realized as we were recording this that Kristen and I were sort of talking like when we talk to a patient and we don't explain what the medical words that we're using mean. So I wanted to break that down so you don't have to go Googling what's the difference between debt snowball and a debt avalanche. So a debt avalanche that Kristen is about to talk about is when you pay off your debts in the following order. You start with the debt with the highest interest rate and pay that one down and then go on and on towards the lower interest rates. This is good from a money standpoint, from a mathematical standpoint. We'll talk about that in a minute, where you're paying off the loans that have the highest interest rate so that you'll pay less interest over time. Option B is the debt snowball, where you list your debts smallest to largest based on payoff balance, and you pay off the smallest one and the next one and the next one. Psychologically, this gives you some early big wins. It does actually cost a little bit more money, but the plan here is to get the debt out of your life as soon as possible. Kristen will talk in a minute about breaking down bigger debts to have smaller celebrations along the way, but I didn't want to keep the episode going without making sure that you understood but what the difference was between a debt snowball and a debt avalanche. So avalanche is highest to lowest interest rate in the order of debt payoff priority, and snowball is lowest to highest payoff balance. Okay, back to the episode. Absolutely the avalanche. <laughs> Hands down, um, debt should always be paid in order of interest rate. Now, if you have like predominantly federal student loans, for example, the interest rate spread is probably fairly narrow. Um, you know, if you have private student loans intermixed, you may have a wider spread of interest rates. But particularly if you're someone who maybe accrued some credit card debt during a program or things like that, Having a debt avalanche that allows you to clear the really high interest stuff first and then work your way down to that 3% private loan hanging in the back, that's going to be mathematically the most effective way for you to do it. Now, it's not psychologically always the best way, but I have found you can pretty easily overcome that by creating your own reward system. And so if you know, hey, look, uh, we'll make up an example. My very first piece of debt is a private student loan with an interest rate of 9% that I can't refinance, but it's large. Maybe it's $40,000. And it's going to take a long time for me to clear that. Rather than allow yourself to get discouraged, create an, a written systematized reward system. So the first 5K that's paid off, you do this. The next 5K that's paid off, you do this. And so you create the psychological wins that encourage you while still doing it in a way that makes the math work. Yeah, I think we all probably did that in school when we were studying for finals, right? We were like, if you get through this chapter on X, you can take a walk around the library and get a coffee, right? Like there's like, you know, that was breaking it down in a much smaller way, but that you don't see the big number. You break it down into digestible pieces where you feel like number one, I'm seeing progress because I'm going towards a shorter term goal in the hopes of, you know, eventually getting this longer term goal. That's super encouraging. 
When people are looking at, you know, they're like, I have a student loan statement and, you know, uh, this is my interest. This is my payment. How is there a good, easy way for them to either go online to find a resource or, you know, head somewhere where they can say, you know, my payment is X. I'm thinking about paying it off early. What if my payment were Y and what result does that have on, you know, our budget, but also on the timeline of paying off that debt? So a purist would tell you to use an Excel template and create an amortization table. Uh, there are way easier ways to do it. Actually, I use a calculator all the time online, um, www.unbury.me. Um, unbury me. It's a kind of a play on words. And it allows you to input all your debt with the interest rates for each loan and the minimum payment for each loan. You can select if you'd like to do Avalanche or Snowball, and there's a slider where you can actually change your payment every month, and then you can see, okay, if I were to pay an extra $500 a month, how does that change total interest paid and time to debt freedom, both of which are numbers that anybody should really be familiar with as you're designing a plan to get out of your debt. Um, I think honestly, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is there is no written plan. There's this general idea of like, well, I'm going to pay extra each month, but that's kind of meaningless. In order for you to actually have a plan, you should be using some type of calculation like this and definitively saying, if this, then that. So that Again, you have the, the zoomed out Google map view and not just the super zoomed in view of, of your monthly budget or that little house that you're looking at there. Um, so use something like that. There's a lot of free calculators on the internet for debt payoff strategy. That just That's one I particularly like. The other piece I have to say when it comes to that is when you're deciding, okay, should I pay extra to the student loan debt? And if so, how much? I do have a very important rule of thumb for you to know. If you are going to pay off your student loan super fast, we're talking about less than two to three years, then ratchet it all the way up, put all your income to the student loan debt, don't worry about it. If when you go to look at that student loan payoff plan, maybe you're somebody that owes $400,000 and you work in private practice dermatology and so you're doing it yourself, don't forget that, you know, that extra $500 a month is great. It's only going to truncate your student loan timeline to maybe seven years, six if you're lucky. We'd have to do the math. It depends on your interest rate. If you wait the whole seven years to start investing for your retirement, it will become the second seemingly insurmountable challenge for you financially. Because you will find that when you finish that debt payoff journey, you're now at the base of a huge mountain where you're having to invest almost as much as you were putting towards your student loan debt just to play catch up. So be cautious of that. If your student loan process of payoff, if you're doing it by yourself, you want to do it quickly, is going to take more than just a few years, you really need to be intentionally investing for your retirement as you're doing it. All of us are late to the game, right? None of us graduate until we're almost 30 years old. Some of us are already past that. So we've already missed our prime investing years. And you have to go into your career cognizant of that and have the sense of urgency of, okay, I'm already behind. How do I catch up? Yeah, I remember one time my dad told me when I was 16, the dollar you earn today is worth more than any other do dollar you will ever earn. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, and I, I'm like, prove it. And so he logged on and showed me this calculator. And he said that dollar, you know, if you wait 20 years and earn that same dollar, number one, inflation has happened, right? But number two, you know, you lost all of this earning opportunity, you know, so like, you know, the, the sooner the better in terms of retirement, the sooner the better in terms of investing in, you know, um, investments outside of that retirement um, vessel. So I want to talk about this. So the person listening is like, okay, so I have to, you know, aggressively or not so aggressively, but also pay down my student loans. I have to fund my retirement. How can I prioritize student loan payoff among saving for my kid's college and wanting to travel and wanting to do all of the things because life is expensive. So how do we kind of prioritize those things? Do you have a good rule of thumb for that? I will say really the, the immediate 
post-graduation phase, you should make it your goal to start investing as close to 20% of your gross income as you can. Have that be your non-negotiable in the background. And depending on your age when you start and your expenses, that should hopefully create an inflation-adjusted traditional retirement for you, meaning you can retire like mid-60s. And then beyond that, if there's I guess I should say before that, high interest debt is always the first thing to go. So any credit card debt, any high interest personal loans, those have to be cleared immediately. Once you've done that, lean into that 20% growth metric and then decide what's my student loan strategy. Having the strategy on paper and an intentional plan of kind of one of those four pathways that we discussed is going to be just as important as getting up to that 20% of gross income invested. Then you can start to piece in after that the other things like, okay, you know, I have a good plan in place for my student loans. I have my own basic retirement covered. Do I want to start funding kids' college? Do I want to travel more? Do I want to invest more and retire sooner? And all of those decisions can be really all very wise and more driven by the individual and their goals than anything else. The mistake I see is when people start doing all that other stuff like, hey, I'm going to start my kids 529 or I'm going to start traveling, but they missed the piece that they can't feed themselves when they're 80 because they didn't do that that first step of funding their own minimum retirement. And so there has to be a little bit of an order at the beginning. But once you get those core things in place, it really does become kind of art, not science. And you might be someone who says, listen, I can't sleep at night because of my student loan debt. Well, then that's where your extra money should go and, and you should clear it faster so that you can have peace of mind. And, you know, maybe you're someone who says, hey, I actually just want to be work optional when I'm 47. Well, then you should invest more and quickly so that you can achieve that goal and kind of let the student loans hang out a little longer in the background. So there's not a right or wrong there once you get past those kind of key metrics at the beginning. Yeah. The older I get, the more I realize that what works for someone who I know well and love and is like a close friend of mine would never work for me. And that's not because I'm right and they're wrong or they're right and I'm wrong. It's because we're different people and everyone has a different threshold for risk and everyone has a different threshold for wealth and everyone has different values and things that are more important to them. And I think even, you know, Chris and you and I are both in this space, but we could sit down and I could say, this is what really matters to me. And you would say, oh, that's good for you. Mine is different. And it's not that like either way, you know, it's just different because we are different people. Um, so I love that, you know, reminder of here's the foundation. You have to be funding retirement. I think we can all say that across the board for everyone. Where even if you're listening to this and you're like, I am no longer in the immediate post-graduation phase, right? Still, we need to be funding retirement, right? We still need to be working on that. We still need to be taking advantage of that. And then what's our plan for getting out from under mountain number two so that we can enjoy? And then with that surplus or with that other money, what are our priorities? What are things that we want to do to enjoy and have fun with money? Because ultimately... It's really not about the money, right? The money is the pathway to the life that you have always dreamed of. While we're talking about having retirement and investing running in the background, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite books on this topic. It's called The Automatic Millionaire, and it talks about automating as many things as possible. We all know that decision fatigue is a thing, and if we have to make a choice to save and invest and create the future that we're dreaming of, sometimes we'll choose not to. Or if you're anything like me, sometimes we'll get busy and forget. Because for me, if it's not scheduled, it's not happening. With the Automatic Millionaire program and process, you don't have to schedule anything. You set up automatic draws for savings, for investing, for making sure that your 401k, 403b, or simple IRA is funded on the back end at work. And then the money never comes into your account. So you don't miss it because you don't see it. It is something that you need to check in on periodically. We check in on ours about every once a quarter to make sure that we're still funding things that we believe in, to make sure that we are still funding enough money to the places that it's going. But the automatic millionaire will teach you to do this amidst your busy life of taking care of patients and making sure your family is cared for, that when you automate it, you don't have to think about it and it happens in the background without you having to make a conscious choice. I will link the book and the audiobook for The Automatic Millionaire in the show notes. Back to the show. That's very well said. 
Awesome. So can you tell us if you, when you're working with clients, do you talk about priorities and really saying like, Hey, with that surplus, like we've got the, you know, retirement on the run, we're investing, we're working on paying down student loans, you know, how do we know what matters to us, which as adults sort of feels like something we should have figured out. But I think a lot of times we're too busy living our lives to think about what we want our lives to look and feel like. Yeah, we do. And I will say it's almost never um, the same between any different people. Um, you know, some people will say, hey, I really want to travel a lot now. And so I'd rather have more flex money. And then, you know, other people are really focused on like, I want to be able to have a season of being part time because I have small children and I'm okay to go back to work after that full time. So I want to know what that way would look like financially. And other folks just want to be full blown early retirement. I mean, I worked with one uh, couple, they were like, uh, by the time we're in our mid forties, we want to sell our house, buy a sailboat and sail around the world. I'm like, cool. Uh, you know, so it just depends on, on the person. But I think at least for me, one of the key pieces of figuring it out is spending a little bit of, um, quiet time with yourself doing what I call a vision casting exercise. There's all sorts of different terms for this, but either you, or if you have a long-term partner or spouse together, sitting down and going like, okay, what does life look like in 10 years if it's our best life? Really, what is that? And what does life look like when we're 70 if it's our best life? And then taking that framework and then working backwards for the money parts to go, okay, so for that to be true in 10 years, what needs to be true in five years? And then for that to be true in five years, what would need to be true at the end of this year? And you can really pretty accurately backtrack your way to what you should be doing right now in order to get you where you want to go. But if you've never really thought through where the place you want to go is, uh, you're probably not going to get there. Yeah. And also a good opportunity, especially if you're living life in partnership to say, Hey, um, remember that time when we met and I was 22 and I said, I want to travel all the time. Well, it turns out travel stresses me out. Right. So like things have changed, right? So this is something we should be, you know, it's a fun thing to do. And I love that you're like, let's dream. Let's like, look and think about what it's going to look like. But also let's touch base. Are we on the same page? Is this what we want? And then even more so, cause the dreaming is amazing, but it's not effective without the action. So then saying, are we living a life now that's in alignment with those values, but also, and I think this is a big, but also because you could love travel now, but be spending so much on travel that you won't be able to travel then. So if you want to travel then, you know, do we back it down? Do we adjust the way that we're spending on travel and just, you know, seeing this as a sort of moving target where we can say, Hey, you know, this year we had um, unexpected expenses. And so these things that we love would love to do, we're pausing for now. And that that sacrifice for long-term gain is sort of par for the course. And despite what you see on the internet from strangers that you are following, that there are people out there who didn't take a family vacation this year because they had to buy a new car with cash. Like those things are just happening and no one is posting about it because it's not that sexy. Yeah, this, this is so true. This is so true. But um, like you said, I it is one of those things where like, it's always a moving target. And so you should probably be checking in here with yourself, you know, every like six to 12 months on something like this and go, has the vision changed? Um, you know, is where we're heading still where we think we want to be? Do we need a course correct? And I think if you are kind of getting into the habit of someone that does that, it makes it so that when you wake up in a few years, you go, yeah, this is kind of the life I was trying to create um, versus kind of waking up one day and going, how in the world did we get here? And how do we get back to where we want to go? Most PAs bring home a decent paycheck, but aren't sure that they're investing enough or what approach to take for student loans. Caleb Pepperday is a certified financial planner who works specifically with APPs. Seeing that PAs, including his wife, were overlooked and physicians were treated with respect in the financial planning industry, he sought to rectify this mismatch by serving PAs with the excellence we deserve. Caleb's mission is to help make financial planning affordable for APPs, regardless of their asset level. Head to advancedpracticeplanning.com and hit the schedule a conversation button to book your free consult. Your money is your largest wealth building tool and failing to utilize it well could leave you wanting to retire without enough in your accounts or still having student loan payments when your kids are ready to attend college themselves. 
Caleb's clients can enjoy their money guilt-free while feeling confident in their savings and investments. Head to the show notes, tap the link, and call Caleb for your free consultation. On the call, Caleb will help you to determine whether his one-time or ongoing financial planning services are right for you. Yeah, that's reminding me. I just saw um, a quote the other day um, where it said direction or your heading matters more than your speed, right? So you can be going really fast, right? You can be like, we're killing it. We're saving, we're investing. But where, you know, where are you going and why? And those things are questions that we don't often pause long enough to consider, you know, are we going to a place we want to? Will we have enough to fund that lifestyle? And why does that matter to us? Because if we're worried about making memories with our kids when they have kids, are we also worried about making memories with them today? Because if we are so worried about the future, we can say like the flip side is we're missing out on moments today because we're like, I got to go to work and earn so that we can have this life, you know, in many, many years. So lots of things to consider. And I do think this is a deeply personal, individualized thing that is not set in stone that is sort of constantly changing. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And, you know, different seasons of life will shift it. My everything, really everything I I feel like that I thought about money changed when I became a mom. And, you know, it's like things re kind of reshaped and um, by no means for the worst, but things are just, you know, in a constant state of change. And I'm sure when I'm no longer a mom of a little, little, and I have like school age kids or college age kids, I'll shift the way I view the world again. And, you know, always in flex, but if you're touching base um, with yourself and your goals, especially with your partner, um, if you have one, then the end result ends up being positive. This is one of those things where if you have a partner and you have combined finances, doing this exercise on your own will be powerful, but it will not be enough to get you where you want to go. It is so hard to achieve financial goals as a couple if you're dragging one person kicking and screaming down the road by beside you. So this is something where you really have to have intentional conversations to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Okay. Last time I'm going to interrupt you, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that we have actually not one, but two podcast episodes where I share with you how we do money as a part of our marriage. So those are, let me see, I wrote them down. Episode 182, which we recorded just after our 10th anniversary and episode 35, which might be a little hinky because we recorded it early on in the podcast recording process. In those episodes, I unpack how we manage money inside of our marriage. And honestly, especially on the episode with Dan as a guest, he calls me out a little bit on things that I do well and things that I do not so well. This will come as a surprise to no one who knows me well, but I'm a little bit high control. So existing inside of a marriage with me is not always the easiest thing. And managing your money in partnership takes practice, so much practice and so much intentional communication. So if you want to know how we do it, I'll link those in the show notes. But again, it's episode 182 and way back at the beginning, episode 35. If you want more about our personal approach to money inside of marriage, enjoy the rest of the episode. Yeah. As with all things in partnership, it requires constant communication and recalibration and figuring out how we're doing for sure. So Kristen, this has been so lovely. If people are like, I need more of Kristen, I want her to coach me. I want to know what her services are like, where can they go to find more and to connect with you? Um, we are on Instagram as our main social media platform. Uh, that's www.instagram.com slash strive with Kristen, Instagram handle strive with Kristen. And, um, our website is www.strivewithkristen.com. Um, both of those places will be a great stop to find out um, how we can help you. We've got all sorts of resources outside of formal coaching. So um, hopefully, regardless of where you're at in your money journey, we can do something to help get you where you want to go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for coming back on the show and sharing your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. If you've been around here for a minute, you know that personal finance is one of my very favorite topics. And you can't have personal finance without that word personal. It doesn't matter what your supervising physician or collaborating physician or colleagues or neighbor are doing about their student loans. It matters what you are doing, specifically that you have a plan and that you're working the plan. Because I don't know about you, but having a plan makes you feel better about knowing that they won't be hanging around forever. So press pause, rewind, listen again with a pen and paper. 
take notes and decide which of those four strategies you're going to use to pay off your student loans and then work that strategy so it fits into your life and that you can still enjoy living your life, saving for retirement, investing for your future, but getting those student loans out of your life for good. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to another episode of The PA Is In. This PA is out. Congratulations. You've just joined an awesome club. By listening to a full episode of The PA Is In, you are officially on the Unicorn PA team. Welcome aboard. What most team members do is they subscribe to the podcast because that allows them to automatically get the latest episode of the show. The life of your dreams exists on the other side of taking action. Keep making small shifts and keep getting better. Your life will improve, your career will soar, and you will have the confidence you need to create your own success. I will see you in the next episode. This PA is out.